greetings to you. We were uh, discussing the chromium removal from the uh, electroplating effluents and I had shown you in my previous slide uh, some schematic diagrams for the removal of chromium and I had shown you these slides uh, anodic process and uh, cation exchange process chrome purifier etcetera, etcetera. These are all different schematic diagrams which can handle different quantities of chromium generated uh, from uh, a variety of operations. So, it is not, it's not that the process is same or uniform for all situations that you must understand. Even though the chemistry remains the same, we have to um, we can change the design to suit the industrial operations depending upon the quality and quantity of the effluents. So, now coming back to the, but the chemistry does not change now. So, coming back to the chemistry of this uh, chromium reduction, I want to tell you that basically chromium reduction is uh, can be accomplished by ferrous sulphate, sodium sulphur dioxide or sodium sulphite, uh, hydrosulphite and many of these reaction these are all reducing agents. So, in presence of free mineral acid around pH 3 followed by an alkali addition to precipitate the hydroxide. Basic reactions can be pre represented like this. This is potassium dichromate uh, sorry hydrogen uh, dichromate if I put potassium here it will be potassium dichromate otherwise it is chromic acid H 2 C R 2 O 7 is chromic acid reacted with ferrous sulphate followed by sulfuric acid addition and it will get reduced to uh, chromi, uh, chromium 3 and ferric. So, this will be chromic sulphate and uh, chromium uh, chrom sulphate and this will be ferric sulphate followed by water that is part of the reaction and this uh, Cr2SO4 thrice can react with lime now because we are going to add lime. It will produce chromium hydroxide and 3 moles of calcium sulphate is just an exchange reaction, but calcium chromium hydroxide will precipitate and uh, this ferrous sulphate also ferric sulphate. Now, the ferric sulphate also will react with 3 moles of uh, calcium hydroxide to give ferric hydroxide and calcium sulphate. The problem is the 1 ppm of chromium and 16 ppm of CuAs. 6 ppm of sulfuric acid, 9.5 ppm of lime produces 2 ppm of chromium hydroxide and 0.4 ppm of ferric sulphate and 2 ppm of calcium sulphate. If you convert all these things into moles, uh, molar concentrations, then you will be surprised to know that 1 mole of chromium produces 454 gram of total sludge out of which chromium will be a small component of uh, the total sludge that comes out of chromium operations. So, chromium reduction followed by hydroxide precipitation is always a losing proposition if you want to convert it into uh, uh, chromium hydroxide for disposal. Obviously, disposal does not mean uh, um, recovery. So, in the end all the precipitated chromium hydroxide, ferrous hydroxide, lime hydroxide, lime calcium sulphate all those things will be disposed of either in a landfill or in uh, TSDF. What is TSDF? toxic substances disposal facility. So, for 1 mole of chromium for disposal if I have to produce 454 grams of sludge 
we can imagine if I have to dispose of several tons of chromium, what happens to the sludge quantity and how it will be disposed of and if it is not disposed of properly, what will, will be the fate of the environment or the soil in which it is deposited or the water in which it will seep down. So, that kind of problems are always there associated with the chromium disposal. As it is in Bangalore, uh, there are uh, number of factories in Pena and other places where chromium plating is, has been done extensively since last almost 5 decades and at the about 3 4 decades before till that time uh, till around 1970s until the environment act came into force. Most of the people used to dump their uh, chromium in their own factory uh, dump yards and from there chromium has gone underground. Nowadays, wherever you dig in Pena area, Pena industrial area, you will get effluent something like Fanta or gold spot and uh, that kind of color containing approximately 165 parts per million, 165 to ppm of chromium will be there, hexavalent chromium that too and uh, that is very dangerous will be there if you dig any bore well anywhere in Pena right now. A whole aquifer under uh, underground area where waters are uh, effluents are collected from the bottom, collected in the bottom of the earth from where bore wells are dug approximately 800 square feet um, depth. All these chromiums, hexavalent chromium have accumulated and it becomes very, very difficult to treat that kind of waste. So, the uh, apart from chromium, there are not many other cases which will cause so much of heartburn and uh, you know public discussion and technology development. No, not many other metals are there at all. So, in case of other metals, oil and grease bearing waste. Uh, can be neutralized, they can that can be completed by recombining the deoxidized chromium and oxidized cyanide waste, neutralizing to pH 7 to 8. The flow is large and heavy, hence, settling is best. So, sludge is removed and lagooned for slow drying, and afterwards, again, sludge is disposed of in the usual manner, part of it could be burnt also and uh, things can be uh, reduced handling this thing. Now, here is a uh, solubility curve for uh, sparingly soluble salts of uh, dissolved metals versus pH. Here I have written uh, the bottom one if we take it is silver sulphide. Okay. Here you can see around pH 2 solubility is approximately 10 raise to minus 6 uh, milligram per liter that is ppm and as you increase the pH to about 10 it still decreases, decreases, decreases and falls to almost 10 raise to minus 12 around pH. So, it, it makes sense to convert all the metal bearing waste into alkaline uh, uh, treatment, subject them to alkaline treatment. So, that most of the metals whether they are sulphides or hydroxides or oxides can be converted into insoluble salts. So, uh, now, look at uh, lead sulphide, lead sulphide is here that is around pH 3 solubility is approximately 10 raise to minus 2 that could be 10 raise to minus uh, 1 let us say. Okay. So, 10 raise to minus 1 this could be 10 raise to 0 this could be 10 raise to minus 1 the most of these the 3 
zinc, cadmium and lead sulphide are approximately in 10 raise to minus 1 range around pH 3. But as the alkalinity increases, as the pH increases to let us say around 10, the solubility will decrease to 10 raise to minus 4, minus 6, minus 8 level that is a ppm level. And at this level ppm parts per million level, these salts are not so dangerous. Now, look at the uh, hydroxides, copper hydroxide uh, initially it dips, but then as the uh, after around pH 8 again there will be certain amount of solubility and it does not make sense to take them all the if you are precipitating them as hydroxides to uh, take them to total alkaline conditions. For example, uh, here it is uh, for zinc hydroxide it is approximately 9, calcium hydro copper hydroxide it is approximately 8, 8 and 9 and afterwards the solubility keeps on increasing. So, it is um, similarly for cadmium, cadmium hydroxide, cadmium sulphate uh, cadmium sulphide is better if I want to dispose it off as a sludge, but not cadmium as hydroxide. Now, because cadmium hydroxide starts dissolving precipitating from 10 raise to minus 1 to 10 raise to minus 2 around pH 10, if you increase the pH condition alkaline conditions, it will increase. Um, the, the solubility will increase and cadmium will go into solution again. Same thing is true with uh, lead uh, hydroxide and silver sulphide, uh, silver hydroxide is the only exception where the precipitate keeps on, the solubility keeps on coming down. So, this kind of graphs help us to decide what should be the pH of the sludge before we start filtering it. So, here you can take a look at uh, some of the reactions that are involved hydroxide and sulphide equilibrium in the plating effluents. So, uh, you can see this box, the, there is H 2 S here gas and if it is in aqueous medium it will be H 2 S aqueous that will be in equilibrium with H S minus and H plus this is all these are all in solutions. Okay. And uh, H s minus can give you H plus and S 2 minus and if there is metal these sulphide ions can combine with the metal to form sulphides as solids which can be filtered and removed. Now, uh, here the moment you add alkali we have an equilibrium reaction M O H twice going to solid to liquid. Uh, MOH twice liquid and these can get ionized OH minus and then OH plus metal or hydroxide and then another OH. So, if it this loses OH I get a metal uh, salt uh, divalent metal I have put and if there is a ligand I get ML ligand this is again an equilibrium reaction and if there is an acid the ligand can also combine with acid to give HL that is the ligand in the acidic form and H 2 L as the complex form. And then metal also can react with MHL to give um, MHL and MOHL, L is always a ligand, H in OH are additions coming from the solutions. Now, here is a graph that explains what is what is happening in the uh, precipitation of sulphide. If I have a sulphide solution as H 2 S, the solubility is almost 100 percent around pH 2, 2.53 and then slowly solubility decreases and then reaches minimum and then again 
uh, it will increase uh, solubility will increase here in this case. So, if it is H s minus ion it will start the, the formation of H s minus ion will start around P H 4 reach here maximum around 10 and then the concentration of H s minus ion decreases. So, we should always find a point where both these curves interact. So, that the solubilities of both are optimum here. If I choose P H 10 sulphide will be solubility will be minimum, but as H s minus solubility will be maximum that is not desirable, but somewhere here the solubilities of both sulphides and H s are minimum here and that is the point which I will have to choose for treatment of sulphide bearing wastes. So, based on these reactions I can have something like a I can design a schematic uh, program for the treatment of waste containing the samples that is effluents containing the alkali acid and alkali wastes. So, I have waste water coming in here I add NaOH pH will be 8 I pump it into the reactor and this reactor will have an input of polymer this uh, waste is uh, coming into a holding tank this is the holding tank and sulphide I can add as a uh, separate stream and the effluent discharge can happen from here. So, whatever is the sludge that will settle down at the bottom here which can be taken out through this pump and to a sludge drying bed. Then I can have another system something like this waste water sodium hydroxide neutralize it and then take it to a mixing tank. Here I add a little bit of polymer and the polymer uh, will act to settle whatever solids are there uh, settling here and then uh, the clarifier the liquid which is on top is taken through the pump into another reactor and uh, sulphide is added polymer is added and everything is precipitated and the uh, liquid clear liquid is taken from the top and from the bottom sludge is drawn off and uh, this can be disposed of in a proper manner. So, this is what happens when effluent comes in I have an acid input, alkali input, sulfiding agent input and polymer input. This is our own research uh, work here we are mixing acid base redox uh, reactions, hydrolysis complexation, adsorption, cation ion exchange resins, dissociation, polymerization, catalysis, photochemical reactions etcetera. The reactions that can happen could be nucleation, co-precipitation, post-precipitation, coagulation, occlusion and several other things that can happen and they will the precipitate will be at the bottom from the top I can take out the effluent. So, some flocculating agents are necessary because some precipitates do not settle easily. So, it is important to add one or two ppm solutions of flocculating agents. The what are flocculating agents? Flocculating agents are chemical substances that makes the suspended particles attract each other electrostatically instead of repelling. This is also known as coagulation. So, use of flocculating agents in uh, industrial uh, scenario wherever precipitation is required is a very common occurrence in all industrial waste treatment operations. So, we can have organic uh, uh, among the flocculating agents there are inorganic as well as organic uh, flocculating agents. 
and I can have uh, poly electrolytes as the flocculating agents and uh, I can use aluminum sulphate. This is a very well known and uh, age old uh, system. Ferrous sulphate is again another one age old system for precipitating many of the things even it is used for water purification. So, the coagulated particles normally end up flocculating and settle under gravity very easily. The process of settling may be accelerated by gentle stirring etcetera, but these are all basic chemical operations which uh, you know one can learn only by experience. So, flocculating agents are normally added to the effluent feed as it enters the settlement tank. So, in this figure I can add a what I show here is polymer that is the flocculating agents. So, that brings us to the end of metal almost end of uh, metal treatment waste and uh, what is happening here is uh, the what remains to be done is treatment of sludges. Sludges as I have said earlier are not really very convenient to handle because the characterization of sludge is very important and it is not easy. Once you have a dried sludge in your hand, if I uh, somebody asks you to analyze a sludge what it contains, it becomes very difficult you have to start a whole chemical operation of dissolving it and then analyzing and all that. So, sludges from settlement tank or flotation tank may contain solids approximately 2 to 8 percent. Whenever you do the operation from the effluent from a electroplating waste, when do you call it a sludge? The moment the solids percentage reaches about 5 to 8 percent, we call it a sludge. That means, the solid particles should constitute about 8 percent. So, such sludges are allowed they or rather they go by gravity settlement and use of poly electrolytes helps increase the solids content to approximately 10 percent not more. But uh, then I will ha I have to subject the sludge containing 10 percent waste to pressure filtration that produces cakes containing 50 percent solids. So, from 10 percent I graduate to 50 percent of the solids still it becomes a slurry it does not become solid. So, after that the sub sludge containing valuable metals we can we can sell them for resource uh, as a resource material or it can be disposed of on land in accordance with the relevant prevailing laws. So, fixing of sludge as a solid mass by using synthetic polymers have also been tried and uh, it is uh, it has seen sort of partial success not uh, always it is a viable solution. So, sludge disposal is again a uh, specialized field by itself where a lot of civil engineers specialize in sludge handling and sludge disposal. So, sludge disposal on land can definitely give rise to pollution problems affecting the soil bacteria and plant growth which may in turn lead to a food chain problem including, uh, um, including toxic effects on all the animals and humans whoever is uh, whoever is contaminated by the sludge um, dumped there. So, possibility of leaching quite often the sludge quite often the sludge material whenever it rains it leaches uh, part of it will dissolve or part of it will be forcibly carried out uh, or transported along with the liquid and then uh, in the solution it can form uh, metal ions and then once metal ions are formed they can move into the streams and rivers anions travel to the subsurface soil matrix that is also another big problem. 
So, proper disposal of uh, sludge is always a matter of uh, great care and lot of engineering uh, um, thoughts must be uh, must go in before you finally, decide how to dispose of the sludge. So, it is preferable to dispose of sludge in approved landfills. These approved landfills are uh, basically a pit drawn on a land. Uh, so, you have to take out the mud, dump your uh, line up the pit with uh, polypropylene or PVC sheets about 2 mm or 3 mm thick on that you dump your waste above that you put some mud to give some soil bacteria a chance to convert the organic material into harmless products and then after the mud again dump your material again a soil like that you keep on slowly building up the waste and then the most tricky engineering part comes in providing small small uh, pipes where the pressure will act to leach out some of the waste and that waste can be taken out and treated separately. If it is in large quantities definitely it must be done and it is preferable to dispose of the sludge in approved landfills where all these things are taken care of automatically. So, if disposal in water is always preferred, a study has to be made to determine the carrying capacity of the stream. This is also important by taking into consideration the dilution factor. So, it is not always a, a proposition to go for dilution irrespective of the uh, size of the receiving tank. Normally, if the receiving tank is having uh, does not have the capacity to take the uh, liquid load, then it is very difficult to revive the it is very difficult to revive the polluted uh, water tanks or water bodies. So, disposal to sea is always subject to license uh, you know uh, waters pollutants going into the rivers and from the rivers into the seas from the seas into international waters. So, one every government is very careful regarding the disposal of industrial effluents into the sea because immediately at the point of disposal there will be problems for the um, flora and fauna in the sea. So, sea animals and they get polluted immediately. So, it becomes very difficult to handle. So, the laws are very strict regarding the disposal of the pollutants into the uh, sea. The danger is localized pollution, this, I, this is what I was trying to explain to you. The danger is localized pollution and potential damage to the environment at the point of discharge, near the point of discharge and if the quantity is large, it can uh, move on into international waters also, where the ramifications could be much more serious. So, materials can be absorbed by sea life, concentrated and passed back into the food chain and so many related problems happen especially with respect to electrochemical waste being discharged in the sea. So, sometimes people have tried sludge containment in uh, cement, people have tried it in glass or polymers that is a very seems to be very attractive option which offers vast scope and potential for future processing developments and uh, effort, efforts have been done to use such cements and glass in 
um, you know in areas where there is no possibility of leaching. So, in obviously, there are problems associated with uh, uh, sludge containment in cement, glass and polymers, but it is again an area which requires more and more uh, um, studies depending upon the severity of the electrochemical waste that is being generated. So, that brings us to the end of uh, our discussion on the electrochemical waste. There are of course, uh, several types of electrochemical waste which require special type of treatment depending upon the quality of the material we are handling. For example, if they, you are doing titanium, then there is not much uh, titanium is not such a harmless element aluminum, but uh, the problem with uh, titanium and aluminum is we do not want to lose such materials. So, there should there has to be a dedicated titanium recovery, dedicated gold recovery, dedicated silver recovery and chromium and several other metals. Then there are certain elements which will vary with respect to the uh, with respect to the resource and uh, if the if we are handling a rare metal it makes sense to recover sometimes many metals are becoming extinct for example indium lot of indium coating and other things go inside go into a mobile and indium and gold is going inside a mobile and that kind of waste if we let it go and there will be millions and millions of mobiles waste which will be lying around and indium is an element which is going to be extinct very shortly. So, we have to worry about such uh, metals and special treatment techniques have to be developed depending upon the requirement of uh, um, requirement of uh, recovery of the metals. So, uh, I hope I have given you some indication of the severity of the problem with uh, electrochemical waste. So, thank you very much. We will continue our discussion with the ultra filtration which is a very important uh, concept in the treatment of industrial effluents and uh, it is something like a new paradigm in the effluent treatment. I will spend some time about uh, maybe 40 minutes or 1 hour on this and then we will go on to batteries and uh, fuel cells and uh, other uh, related uh, electrochemical waste which need to be treated in the uh, in the new modern world where the pollutants cannot be tolerated. Thank you very much.